Though something interesting is that Hyonis is elected to bring a sort of a traditional style neutral ramp dragon, but I think that list has been good ever since it was first even invented with the uh, arrival of Sahaquil. I think it'll do just fine versus like combo decks, control decks, the like. It's uh, perfectly able to close out games, it's got a lot of win conditions. But for now, I think we need to actually focus really hard on Seraph because I think that is <laughs> yes. where Hyonis' entire chance to win lies. And I think Kionis understands that too. We see him playing it first. He knows he has to get a win with it. And if he can, then the matchup swings right back into a 50-50. And that's exactly what he needs to do. Mm -hmm. oh. So if you are Kionis in this, uh, j just piloting this deck, and like I personally have never once played Seraph in my life. I've never even had a copy of it. That may or yep. may not be true. I might have just piled it and forgotten. But... Um, <laughs> So, with my lack of experience, what are you looking for when you play Seraph? What kind of yeah. opener? So, Seraph, really, the opener doesn't really matter. It's a completely reactive deck for as long as you can possibly be. Um, and then you just try to set up your amulets to pop on the same turn as you would want to play Seraph so that you can actually have some followers in play to use while you basically take up your entire 8th turn or ninth turn or whatever it might be with Seraph. Because Seraph, of course, is a countdown amulet that cannot evolve. It doesn't kill anything when it comes into play. So you're basically just saying, I'm going to beat you next turn, but I'm not doing anything this turn. And it's a very risky play. So the early game, it's just finish off my opponent's followers as often as I can, and then just set up my amulets for the late game so I can actually play my Seraph. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, then I think one thing a lot of people, such as I, uh, ignorant and humble players who have never touched Seraph before don't know about this yes. deck, is how keenly do you have to save combo pieces? We saw him use Hollow Dogma after an area there, which is probably his best bet at just developing early board dominance, which, as you mentioned, this deck doesn't use early board dominance for pressure at all. It just wants to right. trade in bodies and not take damage. But, right. um, that being the case, using Hollow Dogma like that, holding things like Healing uh, Prayer, how many do you need to, or like, at what point in the game do you really need to start holding them? And how many do you just have to make sure you never go past? I don't know if there's ever really a reason to not just you do the best thing that you can do on your turn. You play enough amulet countdown or countdown removal uh, cards so that you don't really have to worry about it. Um, and you play cards like Healing Prayer so that you can heal in certain parts of the game, like say against a Roach combo deck, to know that they can't OTK you if you've counted all the cards that they have in their hand, their zero cost and all that kind of stuff. So, But once you start getting close to, if you have Seraph in hand and you know you can go off on turn nine, you generally want to keep around two, especially if you have a Hollow Dogma because it'll draw you a card, right? So as long as you can try to get to that three on the ninth turn to combo off, I think you're fine, but I wouldn't stress too much holding all of your combo pieces if you really need to play those cards. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense considering even right now we're already seeing this is this is not an amulet light deck despite running right. Seraph. It even <laughs> right. has like Globe of the Starways which searches what one would ideally say Seraph. Like the win condition you always have it. But even then there's so many important amulets to hold on to like Tribunal, uh, Sacred Play, basically this whole class I guess to no one's surprise, is geared around amulets which win back tempo, as we see here with Tea Time. Absolutely. And it's it's all about the tempo game with the amulets. I mean, even healing prayer, right? Like, it's a tempo card. You heal yourself, you might be able to pop card draw, you might be able to pop another Tin Soldier out, or a Beast Call Aria, something like that. So it's all just to out-tempo your opponent until you play Seraph, and then they gain all the tempo back, and hopefully you don't lose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So but. I guess if that's, yeah, if that's really just the game plan we're going to be seeing here, then it's, I guess it's like, if we focus on what Essia is working on here, then we find he's at a very awkward turn. Um, I tried seeing that it, it looked like it would be a super advantageous play to be able to just ignore Kionis' damage. Who cares mm -hmm. how many times this Tin Soldier hits me? It needs to hit me four times before I'll die. There's no burst in the deck. But right. his hand is full. Um, so playing another Princess Mage makes little sense. It looks like he just goes for Rhinoceroach Ancient Elf here. Yep. And this is a type of attack that we expect from Forest um, if they are playing Ancient Elf. And this also really makes you feel good that you are playing cards like Healing Prayer because you can essentially just negate everything that Essie is trying to do this turn. Mm -hmm. 
And he doesn't even necessarily have to use it this turn. You know what I mean? He can wait until he has more amulets in play, get more advantage off of it. He knows he's not going to lose next turn. So I think it feels just fine with us. Ooh. And that's a very interesting choice to evolve it. Um, tries to cash in damage. But that actually places a very high amount of emphasis on trying to get rid of the Tin Soldier. It almost seems as though he's afraid of it. Um, yeah. In that he has a Cassiopeia in hand, and that threatens eight damage spread across things. And Seraph, as a deck, is not really a very follower-heavy list. You don't imagine he would pop like a, uh, a area again on the turn that he plays it. So I find that to be right. a really interesting evolve. I like this too, because what it does set up is if Kionis wants to play another something like a March Hare's Tea Time, that Cassiopeia will be able to actually take out both. So he doesn't have to worry about pressure. And that's exactly what a combo deck would want to do, right? Extend the game for that one extra turn, extend the game for that one extra turn, because Essia knows he has at least until turn nine uh, in which he's going to lose. So spreading mm -hmm. out these turns right now feels really good. Right. And even now, area, tea time on board, but again, as I already kind of mentioned earlier, that hit face for five damage, Essia might as well still be at full health. That's right, kind of the nature right. of... Uh, alternate win condition uh, decks like Seraph, where if it really is just not interested in your opponent's life total at all, damage completely doesn't matter. And so I'm surprised, there. actually, still, that uh, he went for... You already justified he went for the play to try to keep Kindness's board clear, but I think it doesn't really afford that much uh, attention. I don't think so either. Like, I personally probably wouldn't have used an Evo point like that, but I can see where Essie is at because he has two Cassiopeias. He knows he's going to be able to keep the board clear. Um, and he doesn't feel like he needs the extra Evo because he's playing against Seraph. I think he knows that if he can get to a certain point, he's just going to win the game. Um, however, in saying that, not having an Evo point for this turn and or not having it for a combo damage turn might actually hurt him in the long run. So we'll see. Right. Now, that I found to be a really interesting turn. Kanos okay, just simply tossed out his healing prayers to develop his board as much as possible, which goes completely mm -hmm. like on the opposite of what I described his game plan would be. I was thinking he doesn't worry about followers at all as long as he's at full defense, but that play almost feels like he's just trying to win the game with board. Right. Right. And this is kind of the trap that I find Seraph fall into. So like Seraph can just win with followers. In in most cases, it does just do that. It's a control deck. As long as you can control the game, a lot of times it doesn't matter what followers you have. They'll just kind of bowl over your opponent as you're dealing with everything that they have. Um, the problem with Seraph is that it doesn't really have any backup to the plan. So like even if it pushes all of this face damage, even if it presents this big board, it can't really do it turn after turn. So if you can stop their like one onslaught, then you put them right back on the Seraph plan. And as we see, Kionis doesn't even have Seraph. That's why we saw him so easily use all of his countdown removals. Um, and now he's just in a really bad spot. He's just got a deck that doesn't really do anything or present any kind of a lethal in any timely fashion here. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, I, I guess you uh, originally had described this as a very reactive deck, and now I'm really seeing mm -hmm. it. Um, to extrapolate upon how little pressure it really presents, you see this hand is fully reactive, but that is a problem with the nature of very reactive decks, is that... Yep. Essia's board right here is not difficult for really most decks in Shadowverse to deal with. You do have to remove the attacker, but in a deck that tries to pack as much efficient and powerful answer everything that it possibly can removal, such as Themis or Holy Sentinel to try to go wide, tea time right. to kill two things, you don't really want to actually commit any of these things here. And like... Rainy said before the before the game even started, without any wards in hand, Kionis is just praying every single turn that lethal just doesn't happen. He doesn't really have a defense against it, so he's just like, I'm at 20, that's the best thing I can do is just keep myself at full health to try to stall out the combo for as long as possible. And he's got the time, which is good. Essia mm -hmm. doesn't have full combo in hand, so he's got some time here. At any rate, Nature's Guidance and Airbound Barrage in hand is... Probably going to get Essia pretty close, still only one Roach in hand, but we just we just saw Kionis evolve face with Tin Soldier in trade. I think <laughs> right. I think he's completely abandoned the Seraph plan with that. Yeah, I think he has to. Without any countdown removals in hand, without any Seraph in hand, he's just gonna rely on his card draw to kind of get him there. 
Um, Essie just has really great plays here, though. He can he can almost full combo here with just a single roach and just airbound barrage to pick it back up and kill the tin soldier. Not really worry about the snow white. Um, and then just really just keep waiting for his combo. I mean, he can do a lot of poke here, and I think he should. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, also considering his poke sticks now if he goes for it, he actually chooses not to and develops an Aaron instead. This I, is I actually fine. really like that. Yeah, it's perfectly fine. Getting your Evo point back is not bad. Putting up something that your opponent can't really deal with. However, the reason why I kind of like the poke option is because it could set up a lethal faster. And if he does this play, it could open up a world where Tribunal comes down, you take six, and then he plays another threat, and then he might be threatening lethal on the following turn. Fortunately for Essie, Akimitas does not have the hard removal for it. Um, something I also find uh, worth mentioning, though, is like with that play, he does manage to develop a couple of resources he can use for an OTK later. But if mm -hmm. he went for a poke, he knows the. I think the only healing that's actually in this Seraph list is the healing prayers. Unless I'm overlooking something obvious. No, I think it yeah. is. Um, that being the case, he has no evolves left for uh, Heavenly Hound to even create a barrier or a ward of any kind. So that more or less just sets up any damage that he puts down is going to be permanent. Let's see, is this a lethal setup? We've got four damage, we've got a bounce. It's gonna be six. six damage, and then bounce into eight evolve. Eight evolve. Yeah. That's it. So never mind what I was saying. Essie is like, I know when I have lethal, bro. Turn nine, full 20 damage, easy stuff. Yeah. Who needs poke actually? He saw that a long time ago, and that's that is actually really like that is the kind of play from Roche C that divides someone who just kind of picks up the tech because they know it's strong, and someone who's definitely right. played it for a long time, because that was invisible to me. I have, I have absolutely <laughs> no expertise counting Roach damage with only one Roach, but he saw yep. it, and that's really impressive. So things to know if you guys are wanting to pick up Roach yourselves in the future is always count your bounce spells and always count your Roaches as your full play point plays, right? So like every Roach is three essentially that you want to play, because you have to play it, bounce it, and then replay it, right? Except for your first Roach, which mm -hmm. costs two. So as long as you can count your play points appropriately, all you have to do for the rest of the turn is just count how many spells you can cast before your roaches. And then, right on. <laughs> and yeah. you get them. And like you said, it, it becomes... separates the good from the bad, because if you know you have lethal on 9 without doing any poke damage, then his play becomes correct, right? Whereas if he didn't have lethal damage, maybe it's not correct. And so on and so forth for every individual turn. Do I need to do poke here? Do I not? Do I have lethal on this turn? Do I not? So, mm -hmm. absolutely. And it... It can become really hard for your opponents to read as well. Because Kionis, for all he knows, he's playing against Roach combo, but he doesn't see a Roach all game until about turn. Well, he sees one Roach uh, come out early on and get bounced. And that's it. Right. He never takes another point of damage until he's dead. Right. And and like you said, that's, that's super hard, right? Like, if you're at 16, you know that they could be getting there, that kind of thing. But if you're at 20, maybe you play this turn, you're like, you know what, they don't have it yet, and I'm just going to play out a tempo turn, and then they have it, right? So, like you said, it's just way harder to read when your opponent's at 20, um, or when you're at 20, rather, uh, and it just makes all of your plays just like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know what I need to do this right. turn. It can be a lot easier to count in a matchup like the one we're heading into now, where you know mm -hmm. you're going to get hit twice by a Genesis Dragon, and maybe they evolve once. That's it. It's 16 right. maximum. Much more clean, but... I think, uh, as we mentioned before, this is actually like Kionis' worst spot he could be in. He needs yeah. to win this with Seraph, and it's not exactly the easiest matchup ever. I don't think he can ever win against Dragon if he goes with this, or if he's forced into the same plan as last game, where Absolutely. he just has to try to win with Tempo. Absolutely. And so, one thing I actually want to talk to you about, Seraph, because we've seen different iterations of it over the last couple weeks. Do you think it's right to go with the full amulet package with the globes, with the sacred pleas, with the beast calls and all that stuff? We also saw Bottles' version where it was just like globe of stairways and seraph so that you can always get your seraph every single game and then you get your card drawn other ways. That's a really tough one just because like there are a lot of amulets that do so much for Haven that I couldn't imagine gunning them. Namely, Marcher's Tea Time. Um, I think it's really, really smart to be running tea time. It put in a lot of work against Forest earlier, but I think That's there's true. a point at which it can become pretty excessive, uh, especially if you only run two Seraph, and I myself wouldn't dare run three. I can only imagine that being a disaster. 
Um, See, but... I find it the opposite. In On ladder, of course, you'd only want to play two. You never want to overdraw it against aggro decks, things like that, and D-Shift. Of course, we know D-Shift is rampant on the ladder and in tournament play. But for tournaments, mm -hmm. speak of last game, you only have so many games with your deck. If you don't see your win condition, you might just lose because of it, which is what we saw with Kionis. Playing three mm -hmm. in a deck that doesn't have an easy way to search it out or guarantee it, I think would have been correct. Um, unless he was playing just the globe with the Seraph, in which case you only need to play one Seraph, right? Because yeah. you can just tutor for it. So it's it's just, yeah. it's it's, yeah, I don't know. That is actually really true, especially in a tournament format where you know your opponent. There's nothing that can really come out and surprise you. Um, the, even if there are bad matchups, you know what you can ban. Then, mm -hmm. if you, if not three Seraphs, I think it would be correct to run more ways of searching it. Um, even yeah. Prism Priestess or other ways to make sure that you get it every game could help you from having to go into this much less consistent and much harder to pull off game plan of trying to win with tempo in a deck that really isn't built for it right one of the saving graces of playing as many amulets that kionis is running is that it can help you a lot versus dragon so in these late game turns if the combo isn't drawn yet and bahamut's are the plays you know just to clear board create uh, a tempo turn for essius something like that having amulets in play kind of denies that a little bit i mean with tribunals beast call arias march hairs tea times and the like you can actually give your opponent advantage by playing bahamut so in, in hmm. saying that, Kionis can actually make a board where Bahamut isn't a playable card. Mm -hmm. Even then, though, I still think the one board where your opponent absolutely does not want to play Bahamut the most is one where you have Seraph on board. That's true. That's true. Yeah, and um, as we see it, there might be another game where he just doesn't draw it. I feel for him. He's 16 cards in. He has searched with a globe. It is probably very unlikely at this point that he's still not gone into it, but he does have one more Sacred Fleet popping off. I think he's going to need to find it soon. Yeah, because that's one of the important things. So you asked me before, how many of these amulet uh, countdown removals do you need? You need as much as it, as you know you have access to the Seraph, right? Because if you don't have access to the Seraph, you need to use them more liberally to try to draw into it. If you know you have it, then you know how many you can save and how you can how many you can realistically give away. Without knowing, it makes it really hard. Right. And it's a completely different... Uh, and there's also the case of burning in case you happen to open all yep. of your draw. Um, it's, it's a very different case from a deck like D-Shift, where you just want to find the card early and then it just simply synergizes with spells. That's it. Yep. Well, there's the addition of some other things that spell boost like Owl. But when it comes to Seraph, if you don't have the pieces to pop it, then you are passing turns where you should have lethal just to simply wait it out. And against a, any, really any deck with win conditions like we've seen, Roach as a combo deck that's really uh, consistent, this sort of dragon list, which itself really seems consistent to me. I don't think I've ever seen them like in a long period of time where they just really haven't drawn a part of their like three-card combo. It just right. might not uh, make it. Or at least uh, it might not be that easy to find Seraph and pop it on a consistent schedule as that. Not only that, but because of how fast the combo decks are with Dragon, Forest, and D-Shift all being able to win on turn 7, 8, things like that. Especially when you're on the draw with Seraph. You have to wait until your turn 9 in, t in order to actually win with the combo. I think it might just be too slow for the format. Um, especially when you're not running a lot of wards to actually back yourself up. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we see he has all the world, uh, all the wards in the world that he could possibly he want. He's, he's pumped his tech card with the uh, the Holy Guardian, or Holy Sentinel, that is. He has the evolve points for Heavenly Hound, but I don't think that this is actually a matchup where it's going to be that important. No. He'll be able to clear it out immediately. And he has access to almost... Well, he has access to his full combo next turn, but he doesn't have access to just win outright, so... We'll see how, how Essia can actually finish this game out while having combo in hand. Mm -hmm. And in addition, uh, there are times when Ayala isn't really a highly important card in the situation right here. Uh, we saw in a previous game where it's all the damage you need for the combo, but right. when, it's, when it really only comes out late game and your opponent was about to hit their 10 play point mark anyway, it's like Kaonis Clearing this does not hurt him at all. It basically loses the last words because it's gotten so far into the late game. That's right. 
So I, one other question I have for you, because it's 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 been a long time coming, but Queen of the Dreadsea Dragon over most other forms of dragon. Do you think that players have adopted the style just because it is combo centric? It can win a lot faster and basically just assuming a lot of the control that you would normally see in it, like more Bahamut's, you know, more Breath of the Salamanders, you know, Conflagration even, or, you know, Sahas, Lucy's, and Israfils and things like that. Now we mostly just see Queen of the Dread Sea with Genesis Dragon and Ariat or Erd, that kind of thing. Do you think it's just because of the more aggressive game plan it has, or are there any other reasons that you can think of? It's an interesting question because even in or even today, we're going to see a lot of players that have actually chosen not to include it. Mm -hmm. So the livelihood of Dragon without this sort of combo is still like it's not really a question. It's like still working. But as for why so many people are bringing it, I feel like it's because they want to avoid games of poker verse. <laughs> I've talked about it a couple times. Okay. It's it's a term that Japanese players use to refer to when especially control mirrors both players are holding nine cards and neither of them wants to commit anything because the first person to commit something gets it answered or these very reactive mirrors i think you hold such a huge threat over your opponent if they know they have to play around this huge interval of about 16 burst damage or even a huge tempo swing like we saw earlier with zeus and genesis dragon if mm -hmm. you just have that as an option the entire game even if you don't have to play it the second you hit 10 play points then that creates a dynamic where if you have this like uh how should i put it it's like if you have that much damage available it's interesting he throws it out now worth mentioning then uh your opponent can't let you resolve any damage for the entire game um, we see that here but while I, i'm like having trouble explaining this because i'm also trying to dissect SC's no play yeah here. yeah so I'll, <laughs> I'll i'll get into his play i think i think his thought is pop the staircase 100 percent so that I know that I'm going to be drawing my cards at the beginning of my turn. Two, put my opponent into lethal range, uh, and I just pop a staircase. I'm going to get there. And even if I don't get there, I'm still in a really good spot. Mm -hmm. Because this will force a Themis. This also forces a non-Seraph play. So something that we haven't really talked about. Um, I mean, we kind of hinted at it. But if you can prevent your opponent from playing Seraph every single turn from turn eight on, it forces them to have to win with followers. And as we said, that's usually not the best case scenario for Haven. So if you can force Haven to not play their Seraph every single turn from turn eight on, you kind of just run away with the game because they don't really have a backup option. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right. Though, unfortunately, Kaunas still has yet to in two games and perhaps... Over 40 draws has still not seen a single copy of the Sarah. Ooh, and like a champion, did draw a Genesis Dragon, but Kionis riding high on the wards that he does have in his deck. So, not dead yet. Mm hmm. Very fortunate for Essia there was finding the Breath of Salamander. Though, to finish my thought from before, it's kind of like even seen here if even just about four to six points of damage means your opponent holds a lethal threat with Dread Sea. I think that's what. Uh, creates such a huge uh, variety of options for the deck. He mm -hmm. was able to even just throw it away, knowing Staircase has popped, and then just says, well, if you don't put up a ward every single turn, I'm going to have it with just one of the random combo pieces in my deck. Right. That's absolutely right. And it's interesting. Six is an interesting life total. So, of course, Genesis Dragon gets around that, but a single Forte wouldn't. And there's not really mm -hmm. any direct damage in the Dragon deck. So they have to find very specific pieces. So Essia kind of was taking a big gamble by throwing his hand away there, but I still think it was the correct choice because of the staircase popping. Um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes you just have to leave the stuff up to chance. Right. Um, I guess... Or I guess best possible guess would be a better way to put that. Mm -hmm. One possible way of looking at it is that, as you pointed out, knowing Kyanus was going into his eighth turn, he just wanted mm -hmm. to say, if you're going to play your win condition here, then I'm just going to kill you for it. Um, right. Alternatively, if you can't play it, you have to Themis, and then I'm just going to find ideally some other way to uh, get the reach. Right. So calculated. Even better. Calculated guess mm -hmm. on yeah what I need to be doing and how I can win this game. And still no Seraph, so I I really think Kionis is just in a bad spot here. I mean he's he even if he can gain enough life to to you know survive through this turn, how is he going to win the game? I think this tin soldier is really as far as he's going to be able to push it. As we know, this deck doesn't really have any burst damage. I think tin soldier itself is really all that's left. 
So all Essia needs to do is answer that, and then if he can pull an answer to every body that Kionis plays, and we know Seraph doesn't run many, then there's no way he loses in the end, I think. That's right. And it feels bad, but I think Essia just has to suck it up and play this Genesis Dragon and attack the, <laughs> right. the Tin Soldier. <laughs> I mean, you can you can gamble again. You can play your summoner and then hope Rahab can block if you don't draw anything good here. But I think I think you just have to do it. Yeah, right. I mean, he probably understands if that Princess Snow White can hit my Rahab, then really anything in this entire deck is going to finish off the rest of it. Right. Ooh. Okay. Huh. But as we said, because he drew it so late, he only has one countdown removal in the Star Tour in his hand. So he won't even be able to win with it over over the course of this turn and next turn. So playing it feels really rough. Yeah, I I actually see a lot of different ways that Kainos could approach this right now. One of which is maybe March Hare's tea time. He could actually develop Arya alongside that and trade in the Princess Snow White, but it elects to go for the scripture instead. See, this is interesting to me. This is very interesting to me. He sets up a board to where Bahamut doesn't do anything, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. However, he is saying that I'm going to beat you with creatures again, or followers rather, instead of just going for my Seraph plan. He could have actually played Seraph that turn pretty safely, and then just had that be this, okay, this ever-present thing. As long as I can stay alive, I'm going to win. But now he's got to play this follower game. I just, I don't, I don't like it. I don't like going for the follower plan here. Mm -hmm. I think it was a brilliant way to play around something like Bahamut, but yeah. as you can see here, any single option that is too difficult for him to deal with, anything that gives him effective health like Rahab or Sybil, is something he's going to have to stoop down to deal with, and that's still a Seraph that's not ticking, as Essia could draw uh, any number of options here. Yeah, and so... I'm not going to say, Kionis has been playing this matchup very well. You know, he's got his own line to this game, and he is sticking to it. And, it, I mean, I can't fault him for it. Now Bahamut feels really good, actually. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we'll see. It does, but I'm actually it. starting to notice. SCS might not actually be in as good of a position as I thought. Like, I was writing off of how much advantage he got after popping his combo, <laughs> but if mm -hmm. he continues to only draw small pieces like this, actually, I think... Yeah, the Rahab's not going to be enough. I th well, it's going to be enough to stop for now. But I think it's not going to make up the amount of advantage that uh, Kionis has here. Nope. It's it's funny too, Essia really just needs to draw a control card to come back into this game. If he doesn't, he's just going to get overwhelmed by these followers. Exactly what I was talking about. Control doesn't matter what your win condition is. If you draw more cards than your opponent, if you deal with their followers, it doesn't matter what you have left over. These Priests of the Cudgels, unevolved, are scary, okay? They're super <laughs> scary. I'm actually terrified by that swing face. I think <laughs> that does leave up... Well, we've seen how many Genesis Dragons this game. I feel like only two. I don't remember if one was discarded by Dreadsea. Is Essia playing a third Genesis Dragon is the question. Right. I'll check. Actually, yeah, he only plays two. So knowing this... Oh. Yeah, he's playing around that very precisely. He knows, at best, I'm going to have to play around a Zeus here. But he doesn't have yep. the burst left in one card to win this. So yeah, Kionis is in now, a great spot here. Now, I, I actually feel like if he played the Seraph, he would have won the game already and kind of taken away any possibility of losing. Um, But drawing that Zeus... That Zeus changes everything, actually, so again. So good. So good. If Essia wins this, I guarantee you Kionis is going to be kicking himself that he didn't play Seraph when he had the chance to. But if he mm -hmm. wins this, he's going to be like, bros... I'm the best. Made the perfect okay, one. I know how to play Seraph. This is the best, and and these are the types of plays that I love. It's all about player flavor versus caster. You know what we think is right, and you know what I love those battles. The players are generally mm -hmm. right most of the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hard to ever fault them. Right. So you can see Essia pretty deep in thought here about when he plays this Zeus. Is that hitting face or is it trading? I think you have to go face. I think if you give up your opportunity to get this five damage in, you're just kind of saying, I need to keep drawing to win this game, and I'm at four. You know what I mean? Essie is at four here. I don't I don't think I can I can do anything else but just go face. I would even go face with both. Probably not, hmm. actually. That's a little that's a little scary. Five yeah. five is all you need your opponent to be at, so yeah. 
I think there's two more cards that Essie is now looking for. If he does set him to two, which he did, then that means Dragoon Scyther off the top is now also a method of... Oh, that gosh. That tribunal mm. top deck. That's going to be game. Kionis Keona, is going to get a win with his Seraph deck. <laughs> that, Maybe. Yeah, um, that, Maybe. <laughs> I mean, thankfully, he didn't trade with the Ayala now, right? Yeah. Thankfully. Maybe that's what his plan was. Yeah, if you're going to Tribunal, you're going to have to 50 50. I'm giving it to him. I think Tribunal's going to work for him here. Right. <laughs> it did. It did. As he was like, no! You're a solid fighter. Well, the matter the way. Kionis earned that one. He earned that one. Absolutely. Kionis actually like reached a position where he draws his win condition at long last and then just wins without it. Through <laughs> yeah. a very, very that's, careful that's and calculated. That's the problem with Seraph, I think. More often than not, it's just you're never going to really win with the card. <laughs> right. And we saw we saw Kionis. He's looking cool as a cucumber right now. Essia, you know, felt a little bad by that one, you know? Getting getting mm. lucked out, as some would say, by this tribunal, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Now we get to see a nice little mirror matchup. But Kionis, I believe, is running the Saha Ramp Dragon, not the combo version. That's correct, yeah. Now, so, <laughs> something I still find really interesting about Lanskin is I think Essia very confidently slams his combo right before Kionis would have wanted to play Seraph. Mm -hmm. Do you think he actually would have been in a much better position, or at least maybe I'm asking this from a biased perspective, because I think he would be, uh, if he had actually held his cards and just continued to play out the control game? I think he could have put himself in a position to not sacrifice his entire hand um, and still keep Sarah from being played. However, I don't think he needed to. I think his line of play was perfectly fine. Um, mm -hmm. And it was very minor. Um... I feel like a uh, chance for Kionis to actually come back that game with winning with followers because as he didn't draw any of his control cards, he didn't draw anything that could consistently wipe the board. Um, he didn't draw really anything until that Zeus at the end of the game uh, to really come back. He had to use his Genesis dragon on defense. You know what I mean? So just a lot of <laughs> unfortunate circumstances after that play, I think. All right. Didn't even see either copy of his, of his uh, Bahama, which Kionis had played around really, really skillfully. Right. Sometimes, I mean, I feel like a lot of the players that are playing this queen deck um, are just used to just jamming it. You know what I mean? Like, get to 10 as fast as possible, jam it, pop my staircases, and just keep flowing. Like, it's a combo deck, and I just take chances with it kind of thing. Like, of course, if you're in an amazing position, you don't ever have to throw away your hand. But if you're in a position to where, you know, you absolutely want your opponent to stop uh, from playing Seraph, and you absolutely want to, like, ensure that this amulet pops this turn in, in case of staircase, like, you just make it. You just, you know... You just go for it. Yeah. We're seeing uh, Essia kind of go... His hand looks like it's going to develop the same game plan, except this time he has much less ramp than he was able to develop last time. Finally gets to a fervor, but had really nothing but staircases to play until then. Yeah. And Kionis has plenty of ramp. Ramp for days. And it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see if Keonis's threats in, in the case of like Lucifer's Israfils and things like that are going to be hindering enough to Essia's game plan that he has to stop and deal with them. Yeah, it really makes this whole matchup kind of start to look like classic Dragon Mirrors where even if Essia is holding on to that threat of like 14 to 16 damage from Dreadsea, how does he get the rest of the damage in here if Keonis's entire list is built to just kind of float as much as it can at about 20 defense. That's right. That that was always the classic uh, problem with the Dragon Mirror in the first place was if your opponent's at 20 and you're playing, you know, three Israfils and a Lucifer and, you know, all these crazy things that just keep you at 20, how do I poke enough? And that's kind of why Forte fell off the map because Forte wasn't even good enough because you'd attack for seven, they'd heal, you know, four to seven that, that same turn right. while killing your while killing your Forte. And then it was just like it never happened. Um, and I think this is a nice, interesting choice to slot back into Saha Ramp Dragon if you feel like this tempo, crazy dragon is back. However, the old dragon never had Queen of the Dread Sea Genesis Dragon Ariat, so it's a completely different ballgame. Mm -hmm. It's just so strange to me because if before now this mirror was really, as you say, like down to uh, just finding damage, uh, being able to overcome your opponent's threats that are on board, it doesn't really have much burst. 
it can just easily back then it could turn into uh like poker verse as i said before now yeah. it's just like what is like keonis's main method of his winning the game here for himself it makes me wonder is it just like trying to find little advantages like keeping the board from a at, like a pretty small margin all game staying at 20 and producing a threat every single turn that has to be reacted to that's exactly how you won the mirror match before but i think it's even more uh, of a thing in this matchup because he actually does have these big threats that stay in play like forte is a threat sure but easy to deal with something like israfil a lot harder to deal with you kind of have to take some time and just be like okay do i want to zeus into this do i want to you know do i want to evolve forte plus use something or do i want to leave it in play and possibly die next turn you know what i mean and keona's getting the 10 first and being able to play this before any type of Genesis Dragon, Queen of the Dread Sea, all that stuff is just so important. This is a fantastic turn. Yeah, something very, very unfortunate I also notice is Essia being one uh, play point behind him could be the entire difference here because he actually can't answer this Israfil. Right. <laughs> he cannot. And how much damage do we have? Is this already lethal? That's 12. Yeah, plus Zeus. That's already game. <laughs> so, Kyonis basically, without running Dread Sea, is the first to actually accomplish what a Dread Sea combo is, would look like. Huh. That's right. Wait a minute. Oh, he saw oh, the sideball. I was like, okay. He Did he miss it? No, he's just getting fancy Wait. with this. He's got this. Oh, oh, right. <laughs> I thought about it for a second. I was like, oh, so he's going to so, hurt it for another two off the top of my head? Wait, never mind. It's a fanfare. But yeah. Kyonis with style. the pump and the win, getting the win with Seraph overcoming what we thought was the downside of the matchup and just pushing on through my uh, man that was honestly i mean that was a pretty incredible set of games there from kionis and i think he played that incre it really feels like to me he it seems like he's prepared his serif deck incredibly well i mean he